Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Digital Collective. I'm your host, James Hicks from Hicks New Media. You know, this is a show where we focus on the people, platforms, tools, and the technology that are making positive strides within the world today. My guests today are Chris Nagayama and Paul Shabarov from Memesis Labs. And I know I just butchered the, the name of the company, but I know the name of the platform and the app that they're using, so they're going to correct me for sure. They've got a app, they've got a platform, they got an environment called Nufa, which is an AI powered photo editor. It's not what you think. It's not something that's typical out there. It's actually got a very unique niche. It's got a very unique uh, offering and a, and a great business model that is worth talking about. So we're going to talk a little bit about AI bias. We're going to talk about AI ethics. We're going to talk about building apps that protect humanity and not cause more harm. This is going to be a great show. Let's get into it, y'all. Chris and Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you for your time. Uh, I butchered the name of the company. I did. I <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. You know, help, help the old guy out. Someone tell me exactly how it's supposed to be pronounced. So uh, that's probably it's a Mimesis. That, that's what you say, Mimesis Labs, yeah. So Nemesis, Mimesis, that kind of thing. I'll, I'll get it right. Listen, before the end of this 30, 45 minutes, I'm going to have it right, man. But uh, th thank you guys for, for joining and having this converse, timely conversation, right? Because it, it is now that world of AI. It is now that, that world of uh, uh, the proliferation of, of tools and things of that nature within that realm. And I'm, and I'm, I'm glad that our colleague, colleague reached out and said, you know, you have something on the marketplace that could be interesting. And I love the different kind of spin that you're doing. You're not just doing photo editing. You're not just doing filters. You're not just doing here, look at me and let me put, put a little uh, correction on how I look, but actually some aspects of taking that image, taking that photo and actually applying that to do better and to be better, which is kind of how I was talking in the, in the title there about protecting humanity and not causing more harm. Before we go further though, uh, if I could have you guys introduce yourself, I think having that origin story of who you are and what role that you provide within the company is always a good thing to come from the direct individual as opposed to just me. So Chris, I'll start with you, man, just cause you're on, on my left there. Yeah. So I've been working in tech startups for around the last three years. I initially started by hosting events and through that, I got to know a lot of people in the influencer industry. And from there, uh, I helped build viral apps. I helped build social media apps. One of them actually reached top 13 on the uh, app store photo and video in the United States. This is a face filter app. And then through that, I've had some awesome experiences in terms of being able to live with the actual content creators that you know power the creator economy and use these social media apps. I had the opportunity to live in the uh, old clout house or like, you know, uh, content creator houses throughout the time that I've worked in the industry. Uh, and yeah, now I currently work at uh, Nufa. I handle a lot of our tasks related to product development and business development. So that might include stuff like finding investors, investor relations, and finding us partnerships with other companies uh, and really some more B2B facing stuff, as well as optimizing the product for that B2C market with that understanding of the creator economy and what people really can use social media for. Okay, Chris, I can guarantee you that you and I have crossed paths. We really? party together. I've gotten drunk and, and pickpocketed you or something of that nature. Uh, <laughs> and because you, you mentioned some things, I, I can almost guarantee like the, you, and you said cloud, you're talking about the old platform, the social, um, not, not accreditation, but Joe, Joe's company. Um, uh, so you remember, like, remember, you remember KLOUT? So what I'm referencing to that is this, um, so there's an influencer house in LA. Yeah. where uh, like rice gum logan paul and like some of those guys used to live okay and that okay. was the clout house and then phase uh if you know like the gaming team phase they lived there for a bit 
But um, yeah, I spent some time there living and working with influencers because we were building tech products kind of in the creator. All space. right. All right. I get that. I'm, I'm quite sure that at South by somewhere or, or at one Mac world or something at Moscone and we crossed paths and uh, we, we'll talk about that a little offline. Thanks for, for being nice. here, man. Bob, what about you, man? Okay, wonderful. So, so yeah, uh, I, I'm actually director of a VC fund. Uh, the VC fund is called Botan Investments, and we're with, like a small fund that like specializes uh, yeah, on uh, machine learning, like deep tech uh, startups. And uh, one of the uh, startups we're working with is actually now Mimesis. And uh, where I kind of stand out, like uh, from the normal investors, like the standard investors you see, uh, I'm also kind of like their co-founder, whereas I take a very active role in within the startup and help them also develop and grow. Love it. Love it. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it, man. Let's talk about this platform because uh, I'm calling it more of a platform as opposed to just an application. Uh, and hopefully that that goes with, with, with your thinking as well. Let's talk about the platform that you have currently out right now, um, the, the new app and what it is, what it does, what your expectations are of it at this particular point and where you see it going kind of in the short and the midterm. I'll ask you, Chris, you know, you know what is what is the new for platform? So in this current iteration, and I think that Paul actually might be a good person to talk about some okay. of the technical aspects of what we're building. But in our current iteration from the product side, we allow users to upload photos of themselves. And then using our uh, machine learning technology, we're then able to edit those photos and show themselves what they might look like in their peak physical form. Right, whatever that may be. Again, we allow users to maybe they don't want to necessarily be a bodybuilder. We have features that allow them to see intermediary photos of what they may look like in their fitness journey. Right. So this is pretty cool for two reasons. One, we include AI generated workouts as well as AI generated diets for these users to actually follow. And it makes these photos have more of as a motivation type of thing mm. because they do actually get the resources and they are provided the resources to actually achieve this. That's the first thing. And I think especially speaking from my perspective, you know, going to the gym is hard. And I think a lot of things that are worth doing, um, you don't see results like day to day. And yeah. it's kind of difficult to, you know, put all this time and effort in when you don't have that kind of North Star guiding you or some force saying, OK, cool. Like if I just put in this work, like I know I can get to this point. It's kind of a black box in that sense. You don't know what you're going to be able to achieve. These photos somewhat act as a motivator and as an example of, okay, if you were to follow these workouts, this is what you could uh, hope to achieve during this amount of time. That's the first thing. And I think really the second thing that we're currently building out that is still relevant to our product is our product is part of a progression uh, and we view it as like a fluid type of thing. It's not set in stone in its current iteration. This is just where we're trying to start, right? Once we target and, you know, capture like a large part of the, you know, mobile app uh, in terms of like photo editing and that type of stuff, we're going to then expand into the fashion industry. And that's really where we're excited. Wow, okay. um, right now, we're collecting data because a lot of the models are best trained on the largest data set, right? Like that's what provides a competitive advantage in that. From these photos that we're collecting right now, we're, better to, we're able to train our models better to then eventually be able to tackle the problem of AI dressing rooms. There's some crazy statistic that I wasn't even aware of before. Um, actually engaging with the, with this team. And that's like the over 30% of online purchases for e-commerce for fashion in specific end in returns. And that is mind blowing to me, right? You consider this on the scale of companies such as Amazon and mm. Walmart, and that number that they're losing to returns is massive, right? So really what we're trying to do is kind of remove that bottleneck, right? The fashion industry is go, still growing at a fast rate. And in addition to that, the AI industry is growing as well. So what we want to do is kind of capture, capture and capitalize on these market trends of fashion, e-commerce, and as well as, you know, the AI industry, and kind of blend those two together in, in the best way possible. And our current product is going to allow us to take it in a really interesting fashion, right? Uh, from this data that we're collecting now, being able to train our uh, models off of, you know, like the, the human figure, like what people look like and, you know, what they can look like, it then provides us a competitive advantage against other companies that are trying to do this virtual dresser room. I know that a lot of companies have tried to do this, but we do feel that we have a unique approach and we do actually have a really good shot of capturing this because of our step-by-step -step model rather than directly jumping to that one final goal. Gotcha. So okay. we do have our current iteration, but at the same time, that's really what we're striving for here. Okay. Paul, I'm going to have you go two steps deeper in that. And, and I guess I asked Chris, was it that you saw the fitness side and the nutrition side? Was, was it just easier to, to, to start there as opposed to starting at the virtual dressing room with the fashion side and with the, that aspect as opposed to, again, wh wh where you are right now? Was it just easier from a, from a coding and development and, and a, uh, uh, an yes, initial I mean, pitch perspective to go where you are? 
Uh -huh. so, so yes, o overall, like the pictures there, uh, it's very difficult to do like a full on like virtual dressing mm -hmm. room now. A lot of steps need to be done. The like intermediary steps need to be done to to essentially get to that uh, massive goal. And we've kind of picked the the first stepping stone as like uh, being able to like tune bodies. And uh, we saw that there's a good match of uh, the nutrition uh, uh, factor, and that's why why essentially we're positioning ourselves there and slowly moving towards the bigger aim, the bigger goal, is which are virtual wardrobes. I love it. The, this whole concept of, again, not, not just taking pictures and not just making us look better digitally so we can have a cool little IG post or a cool little profile picture, but bringing that aspect on of, of you do some work as well, right? Bring, bringing in that, that fitness plan, bringing in that nutrition plan. Where, how did you think of doing that? Again, could be, was it just because the market was so saturated? And I don't want to answer the question for you, but was the market so saturated with other apps that just do the face tunes and the body tunes and things of that nature, but just looking to level up and actually bring some value to consumers uh, on, on a different scale? And, and that can be for either one of you, Paul or Chris. So, I mean, wh why do something so, so dramatically different, but in my mind, so dramatically necessary when, when it comes to, again, um, making these filters, making these, these augmented yeah. photos of, of the individual. Yeah. You get it? Uh, yeah. So I, I, I get the question. Actually, you're saying that the market is very saturated. If you actually think of just like a body editors, there's not that many butters out, uh, editors out there on okay. the app store and like one tap body editors, like we're currently the only solution that uh, provides this functional. Uh, so we, we, we found, we, we really saw that the first off we have the technology and second off we can be the first and only app to, to do that on the current market. And uh, the, 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 the second step was to just kind of think what's best uh, to, uh, to do for monetization. And that's why essentially we decided to go combine that with the fitness, uh, uh, the fitness part. And that's where we currently are right now. I love it. I love it. Yeah, correct me, right? I, I'm just a guy here pushing buttons and, and turning on the lights, man. I'm actually looking to go deeper into that kind of discussion. Um, who are you, where are you gathering and getting the insight and the information from a training perspective and from a nutrition perspective, right? I mean, are there actual uh, clinicians and uh, nutritionists, things like that on staff, or do you, how do you go about gathering that inf information uh, as well? Uh, we go very simple. Uh, frankly, all we do, we have a list of, uh, of, of trainers, uh, of, of uh, coaches, uh, all throughout the home fair world. So not, not just like US based, but like different uh, countries like Europe, uh, some uh, Asia, Thailand is a good place. And we kind of just take in their insights from there and I kind of combine that, uh, their their input into our app. So we actively brainstorm with them, think of cool ways how we can improve. And now we're actually learning from real feedback uh, and bringing that to the real user. I love it. So it's not just Chris going around saying, don't eat the Oreos, eat the... <laughs> It's yeah, not just yeah. him coding that into the platform saying, you know, stay away from the cookies and chips, but actually go with the one. Okay, good, good stuff, good stuff. What's been, um, and, and either one of you can answer this, well, what's been your biggest hurdle, I guess, thus far, right, with either, or is there really a big hurdle from um, a recognition from the consumer perspective of what the platform is doing? I'm, I'm seeing, you know, from your, your pitch deck and from your PDF and from your marketing materials that you're getting some great traction, at least overseas. But right, has there been kind of a hurdle to an acceptance of what the platform is and is going to be from, from what you're seeing from your market research? Uh, if, if you want, maybe I can answer. So one, one big hurdle that we can have is that uh, mm -hmm. since we're a body editing app, uh, we only take as an input like the, the, uh, like, uh, uh, like the body. And frankly, in northern countries, uh, not a lot of people have photos where they full on show their body, right? And like mainly those photos show up in the in the summertime when the, the, the weather gets better. And that's actually kind of explains why we have traction mainly overseas and warmer countries so such as like Thailand, the Philippines and so on. Uh, but uh, we essentially believe that maybe with, uh, with the weather now changing to something more warm, chances are that it will uh, correlate to tractions within other countries as well. But just like seeing that uh, nowadays, like during the wintertime, not a lot of people have photos like full body photos which they're ready to like use and edit, uh, that kind of like uh, puts us, uh, that's the kind of like a limitation which we kind of have to work around right now. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, listen, I'm going to be underneath the squat rack in about five hours tonight. I may, I'm, I'm going to download the app and, I, and I'm going to see, I'm going to see what this 53 year old is supposed to look like when I, <laughs> when I get through with this training session. Um, 
Is, is this cross-platform as well? I, I know I saw it on, on, on the iOS side, but is it also coming or is it also going to be available on the, uh, on the Android platform as well? Uh, so currently we only support iOS, uh, but essentially like uh, we, we are currently thinking of also the, incorporating the Android side of that as well. So it'll, it'll be a mobile solution and it will, currently we're not thinking of focusing away from the mobile part. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, all right, so let me, let me ask about kind of a higher level and, and not necessarily app specific, but again, since I've got two smart folks in the room who know about AI and things of that nature. And again, I, I talked a little bit about this to Chris behind the scenes the proliferation of the perplexity that AI is, the chat GPTs, you know, all, all of that, right? And for, for us within technology, we know that this isn't uh, brand new, right? It, it's just becoming more prolific for the consumer because now it's on it's on CNBC, it's on, C, it's, it's on television, so folks are seeing it and kids are now using chat GPT to write their essays in school, which is a bad thing. Don't uh, leverage it, don't, don't use it completely. But <laughs> talk to me about how you fit into that discussion, right? Again, and then around the topic was AI bias and ethics and how using your platform and what it is that your platform is doing and is going to do, how, how do you walk that fine line of being, this is an ethical app, this is a good for the for society app, this doesn't overstep its bounds by again, taking pictures and 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 manipulating them, you know, let, let, let's, let's go ahead and say that. Uh, what, what's that discussion that you have in the elevator when someone asks you that for, for a 30 second pitch? So it's actually kind of interesting. Um, so I still currently am in university myself. And so I kind of get to see that chat GPT, you know, wave happen, mm -hmm. happen firsthand. Um, in a previous startup that I worked on, uh, we actually used GPT-2, which is the open source mm -hmm. model mm -hmm. uh, previously. So I, I had been aware of, you know, what, what it can do. But at the same time, I think for a lot of people, like you mentioned, this is really their first time being exposed to AI in such a simple, yeah. uh, you know, fashion. It's not like some open AI playground that they have to enter a bunch of inputs on. And, you know, they probably wouldn't even find the open AI playground because that's just not really too interesting to them. Right. It's something that they can feel, they can use, and well, that it's actually providing value to them. I personally uh, started using ChatGBT around a day after it released, but it was really fast, the amount of adoption that it had. I remember running around showing as many people as I possibly could saying, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, you've got to try this out. Right. This is awesome. And around a week later, they're like, wait, Chris, that thing that you like wouldn't stop talking about, it's actually pretty cool. And I was like, yeah, 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 it is awesome. <laughs> but I think one of the big discussions for that is, and you know, after speaking to a lot of people uh, about it is, it's really useful in terms of ideation, right? Uh, coming mm. up with certain ideas, you, you know, go. schools are already caught on and universities already are caught on to the usage of chat GPT, for example, writing essays or for writing discussion posts, something along those lines, right? They already know about that. And I think once you look at a couple chat GPT generated, uh, you know, essays or responses or whatever, you can, as a human, just get a general sense of, yeah, this is probably AI generated. You don't need something like GPT zero, or for example, to be able to, you know, assess that. What I definitely think is one of the biggest problems, and this is kind of just adding on to what you said about uh, AI ethics right here, uh, is transparency with AI, right? Mm, I completely agree yeah. that AI can be, you know, super useful. And I've seen it, uh, you know, for a lot of my my friends and, and the people that I, you know, I go to school with, they're interested in the, you know, finance area. And so for them, it's really useful to be able to ask ChatGPT, hey, well, can you explain how to make a DCF? Hey, can you explain weighted average cost of capital? Those type of things are awesome use cases for ChatGPT. What's a little bit more ambiguous is when you get into the area of, you know, give me X topics to write about for my essay about this book. Right. That's where it's kind of that gray area, right? And I think the number one most important thing going forward is to use AI as a tool, but not as a solution. You know, all those, well, those might be like synonyms uh, a lot of the time used, you know, uh, interchangeably, it really is ideally used as a tool rather than as a solution. Nobody gains that much in terms of learning and actual practice from just turning in a chat GPT based essay. Using chat GPT to generate a couple ideas, we'll use that as a start and then expand upon those, right? Uh, build off of those. That's really what's key here. And I think that's the main difference maker. So just being transparent in terms of the usage of AI as any tool, right? Um, I think that's like the most important thing or personally one of the things that I see as uh, an ethics problem for AI going forward. What is AI generated and what is not AI generated? I love that. I love that. And that, that's, I mean, that, that's refreshing to hear from the business development arm of, again, your, your company, your organization, your platform, your tool, because you, you realize that 
there's value to utilizing this technology. There, there's, there's pros, there's cons, and there, there's a middle ground, you know, right? There's all these different aspects of this very complex conversation. And you, you're consciously thinking of the best way to leverage this technology inside and outside. So outside from a, from a business perspective, from a marketing perspective, then inside from what the actual, your product is going to be pushing out, what, what new is going to be, because, because you're utilizing AI algorithms and things of that nature to, to gen generate those photos and to come up with the training plans and things of that nature. So again, to hear someone sitting in the business development for a platform that's coming out and quite frankly, I'm going to say it about to blow up, right? You guys going to do it. Come on, man. Uh, this is, I, I can see a hockey stick, uh, uh, uh trajectory for you right here. So having that forward thinking mind from, from you really makes sense. Paul, your, your feeling and your thoughts in terms of artificial intelligence, chat GPT, perplexity.ai, I, I keep mentioning perplexity because I use that one almost every day, right? But uh, for not just th this company that you're working with, right? But are there any other organizations that you're working with that have this AI conversation and, and you have to kind of steer them into how is, yeah. is it best so, utilized for society? Uh, wonderful question. Again, uh, I actually have uh, more context myself. My, about myself, I'm actually uh, uh, I used to learn uh, in the AI field quite heavily. Mm. I'm myself an, um, an NLP engineer, so I actually work with similar solutions like uh, uh, ChatGPT. Uh, and actually, not even that. I train similar models on 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 dialogues. So I kind of like I have a pretty solid understanding of what what the actual black box looks like and that's kind mm -hmm. of helping me mm -hmm. uh kind of also like uh, find guys and, and uh, make conclusions about how strong an ai is and then uh, another thing uh which is also worth noting that i i personally believe that the year 2023 is actually the year of ai so this is the first year where people not only like hear the word ai is like oh yeah there's cool hype about it but this is the year people start to realize that yeah ai actually works and actually start to use ai on a daily basis so examples for chat GPT, maybe you also saw examples of like stable diffusion model where now you can like load a couple of photos of yourself, train a neural network and draws you like these perfect AI avatars. And like people were like going, it was going viral, like everyone was posting their AI avatars. And I think those trends are to, to continue uh, all throughout like to, uh, the year 2023, where people will not only consider AI as like, oh, something cool and trendy, but actually like put it more into their lives. And uh to be fair, I don't, I don't know, like from a moral standpoint, I, I don't know what uh, the outcome will be, but it's definitely cool to monitor that and kind of see how like that's slowly developing, growing and uh, how, how the world is going to change based on that. Yeah. Now, and listen, I just, man, oh, I, I was going to say, uh, uh, for, first of all, when we, when we hang up, go register that statement right there. 2023 is a year of AI. Do it before Elon does it, right? <laughs> just, just get out there and register that before anyone else does it. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, no, no. What I was just going to say about that is, again, it is a little bit hard. Like Paul said, AI is constantly evolving, right? Yeah. Uh, the field is constantly changing and the rate at which it advances is just so fast. Um, so in that sense, we're still trying to find what is actually the best use case for AI here, right? Incorporating it into day-to-day -day lifestyles, right? Uh, you know, it might be great for writing an essay, but for example, if you're not a college student, well, how often do you actually have to write essays, right? So what is that day-to-day -day use case that's really going to allow people to say, okay, this is integrated into my into my daily schedule, right? And then from there, there could be more of a discussion as to what are kind of the, you know, ethics and morals of that mm -hmm. and how do we best navigate that? But for the time being, like it is advancing so quickly that while that is a consideration, it is just kind of hard to keep up the pace, you know, because as soon as you start the discussion, well, it's on to the next thing. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, Nufa, how, how was... The conversation that we just had, how is your your platform going to ride that progressive line, going to ride that positive line, going to actually stay out of the the negative reddits, right? And, and right actually appear to be and actually serve as again a positive influence that protects humanity. Again, back to the topic that protects humanity and not necessarily causes harm. Because again, you're you're, you're doing something again. I, I feel it's unique. Paul said that there's there's many other apps out there to do similar this, but again, to the extreme of what you're doing, and when and I say the word extreme in, in a positive way, because you're not just taking that photo, you're not just taking that image, but you're actually providing value by saying, go eat this, not that. Go go lift this 20 times, right? That, that kind of, you, you're bringing value to that. So how, how do you maintain that again as you continue to evolve on, on the 
current iteration and then when you go to the the, the fashion side with the the virtual dressing rooms and things of that nature how, how do you just kind of keep that forward uh forethought pattern within the technology that you're building actually i i want to say <clears throat> so in our current iteration again um we do provide those workouts we do provide those diets okay. right and so you know um, while we do like edit those photos at the same time that, you know, not to say that it offsets it, but it is something where we do provide, you know, resources and actually to do that. Again, this is just somewhat of a launch pad, uh, for people. Right. And I think in the broader sense, one of the things that I've realized just personally, uh, is fast fashion, right? Fast fashion is like a pretty big deal currently right now. Companies like Shein, for example, mm -hmm. um, right. Like you can buy a shirt for like $5, $4, like it's ridiculously cheap, yeah. but you can get it shipped for, for pretty cheap too. And it's crazy to me because I'll just be, you know, talking to people and they're like, oh, I just got like, you know, 10 new pieces of clothing. And I'm like, wait, that's crazy. Like, how did you do that? And it's like, oh, it was like 40 bucks. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I, th I, th I, th I thought you dropped a crazy amount of money on that, right? And so the thing is, right, these people, and I think a lot of people, they just cycle, 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 cycle um, through these pieces of clothing. And well, what is one of the main reasons for that? You could argue that well, they're not certain. They don't have strong conviction in what they're purchasing because they don't actually know if it's going to fit or not, right? Because nobody needs 10 shirts every month to get, right. or, you know, 10 new pieces of clothing. It's because, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, it's completely fine, right? They don't particularly care about the quality because at the end of the day, it's $4. Even if they hit two out of those 10 of actually being things that they wear. That's an interesting point. Okay. Well, it's still yeah. such huge value, right? Yeah. And so what we want to make sure is, uh, you know, and so I know that there's an entire movement um surrounding you know not necessarily being a fan of fast fashion so companies such as urban outfitters right they kind of perpetuate that idea of, well it's like a 30 dollars t-shirt i'm gonna wear it a couple times and like you know that's about it right but i think one cool application and upside of like what we're generating right now and what we're creating right now for the ai dressing rooms is helping you know combat that idea of fast fashion well i'm not sure if it fits being allowing users to and people in general and consumers to just be able to quote unquote invest in a certain piece and article of clothing and have that one certain piece that they're very certain of uh, for, for a given amount of time. We, we think that that can kind of change the culture uh, surrounding like purchasing clothing of saying, yeah, it's a little bit of a crapshoot, but you know, we'll figure it out. Um, I think that that's one cool aspect of, of what AI could do. And again, uh, in terms of like, you know, cultural impact and societal impact, there's kind of a cascading effect of this as well, right? Uh, by creating one thing, um, it, cause, it starts a chain reaction and it causes a chain reaction. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on, in a broad sense, it is like a little bit hard to tell, but in terms of what we see, it could be like a really cool value add that we can provide, uh, you know, as a whole is helping reduce the, reduce the amount of, you know, waste due to fast fashion and people just buying stuff for the sake of buying stuff. I love that. I love that. Um, let me ask you this. What, I, this can't be free all the time. This can't, Right. And in order for it to be sustainable, right, I, I, I'm a huge proponent of people pay attention to what they what they pay for. So you're, you're, you're bringing value there, there. There's is there a monetization plan from from the platform? Again, what you're providing, even I'm asked of, of that today, not just in the future for the for the fashion side and things of that nature or. Is there a monetization plan to the consumer or is it to maybe like brands and, and or larger companies and organizations that you may partner with? And if that can't be disclosed, if that's NDA, that, that's fine as well. I'm just wondering if you have a monetization platform or piece in, within your roadmap of how you're going to move the company forward. Paul, yeah. I can, I can take this one too. <clears throat> I just feel like you haven't spoken about, but yeah, I can, I can talk about that. Overall, go ahead, Chris, yeah. Overall, I start, I start talking problem. about money and then, and then the investor has to come on. Come on, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, I guess, yeah, you guys threw it to me. So, so one way we kind of want to do it, we want to move into the B2B segment where essentially uh, our business model, maybe it's in the slideshow, maybe it's not. Uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the presentation, right? Mm -hmm. Also, so we also want to speak about right now, right? Like, the, the, the current monetization model right now. Uh, I did not catch it, uh, Chris. Yes, like, you were saying yes, whatever your, your current mon, uh, monetization model is today. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, currently we're, we're getting uh, revenue based on subscriptions, but we okay. want to kind of shift away and go into the B2B uh, segment where essentially we can partner up with big companies like big uh, marketplaces, uh, have them integrate our technology. And like one way which we're considering is perhaps take like a small cut of their sales uh, around like 0.5% and essentially try to move along that path. 
along that trajectory and see uh, where it can take us. Overall, it seems promising, but then again, uh, we, there's still a lot to be discussed and to, to be experimented with. And uh, yeah, eventually uh, we believe we'll get there. Okay. I, and I like that trajectory. When, and when you say monetization right now through subscription, so the app is, is like a four ninety nine app or something, or is, is it feature restricted until you, until you subscribe to it? Uh, there's a watermark. Uh, as, as okay. Most okay. Apps, oh, okay. Okay. Work. You, you can go in the app, you can uh, upload your photo and you can get a perfectly well result. But the problem is you can have a watermark. If you don't want the watermark, then uh, again, as, as you said, pay $5, pay yearly uh, subscription and use it uh, however you like uh, without cool. the watermarks. Okay. I get, man, man, I'm, see, a lot of times when, I, when I'll talk to some organization, especially early stage tech uh, startups, they try to sh they shy away from that monetization conversation, right? It's just give every give everything out there for free. Well, well, no, that's not sustainable, right? If if you're building something, if if Chris is over there and, and Paul or oh, you're over there, leaning over the keyboard, sixteen hours of the day, there, there's value in what you're creating and what you're providing, and, and and if the consumer sees that value, they will they will pay for it. And, and I've seen so many people, and, and again, Chris, you you've been in this world too as well. You probably seen so many folks saying, "No, let's just give it away free. We'll, we'll we'll just throw a whole bunch of crappy ads on or, or whatever, <laughs> right?" But so I'm I'm actually happy to hear that you have that trajectory and that plan going from subscription, going to actually working with larger organizations as well. So I mean, I, I wish you guys nothing but success with from that aspect. And I think there's also one aspect that's like pretty cool. Um, that's what we're doing right now in terms of the 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 B two B side. Yeah. Um, we can kind of use our software as somewhat of an API for other companies in case they wanted to provide a similar service. Right. Wow. So okay. they're able to, for example, send the photos to us and then we're able to, you know, um, uh, apply our, our, our machine learning algos to those and then, and send them the, the finalized version of that. So that's just another way that's like pretty cool to monetize from the B2B side rather than just the peer B2C side. <laughs> that's pretty cool. There is a differentiator. Okay. I'm starting to like you guys even better. And this is okay. This is, I'm definitely, I haven't downloaded. I, I literally just got back from a, a, a trip to Oregon this morning and haven't even had a chance to, to, to do, do all of that stuff. But I, I'm, I'm going to definitely install this app tonight before I go, like I say, underneath that squat rack, make sure, make sure I can get that six pack, at least looking like something you know, in the future, not, not tomorrow, but you know, that kind of thing. Um, what's, what's next? Gentlemen, what, 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 what's next? I mean, today you're doing some phenomenal things. You're seeing some, some, some interesting growth overseas because, uh, you know, like Paul, you were saying more and more folks, I guess, across the pond and, and other locations are, are more comfortable with taking those full body pictures and, and things of that nature. But what, what's next for you guys outside of moving towards the fashion industry and, and things of that nature? What, like, what are you going to wake up and do tomorrow besides, besides code and, bes and beside, uh, you know, the conversations about the, where the, where the company is today, what, what's, what's happening short term and midterm. On like more of a personal level or in relation to the company well, or I guess, no, from, from the, the platform, good, good question. Maybe, maybe we'll talk about personal too, but from the <laughs> platform, what, what can users and subscribers of, of NUFA expect like maybe in terms of updates to the platform, diff, different types of uh, features and capability and functionality, whatever, uh, uh, in the, in the short term. Mm -hmm. So in the short term, uh, as of now, one of the features that we're working on releasing is uh, an adjuster so that people, let's say, for example, don't necessarily want to see what they'd look like as a bodybuilder, but maybe want to see what they would just look like in decent shape, for example, right? Uh, we're including a sliding feature to allow users to not only one, reverse their fitness level in a sense. So let's say they're in super fantastic shape and they say, well, that's a little bit too much for me. Maybe I want to take a step back. What would it look like then? That's a feature that we're adding right now. Another cool feature is, like I said, that intermediary, uh, you know, progress type of photo where they can see themselves at different levels. They don't want to just look like a bodybuilder. They can see themselves at a different fitness level. That's not necessarily on one polar opposite uh, side. And then actually what's really exciting is in Q3 of 2023, which, you know, it's like pretty soon, uh, we're going to be releasing a feature that allows users to try it on, uh, you know, swimsuits, for example. And this kind of acts as an intermediary stepping stone to eventually allow us to get to that mm. full dressing room feature. And that's where we think our competitive advantage really comes into play, right? Uh, the progress that we have made from those, uh, you know, from the current iteration of the app, that data we've collected, it's now being pushed and actually applied here. And we take that nice intermediary step 
between what we're doing right now and what we plan to do in the future in terms of the full AI dressing rooms. And this is kind of that nice little middle ground where you can really perfect the technology and adapt it so that we can really hit the ground running when we do release that AI dressing room. That's pretty cool. I don't know if I'll, I, I'll, I don't know if I'll do the reverse slider. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll probably do it, but I, I won't post that or share that anywhere. Hmm. But that, that that's pretty cool that you're offering that that option. But that actually brought up a question that I had as well from a from a privacy perspective, right? And from a uh, security perspective, how how are you addressing or handling that? You know, what, where is the data stored, saved? You know, what what type of SaaS environment, cloud environment, or whatever are are uh, are you using within your organization to protect the privacy of the users of your platform? Yeah, I think that. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm not like too, too uh, in depth in terms of the technical stuff. So, um, Paul, I think yeah. probably, uh, uh, I can't yeah. so, so basically, Paul, you're it. Tag, you're it. Uh. I, I, I mean, so, so uh, currently, uh, the, the 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 technology works on a server. So that means we do have to send the, the data over to the server. And basically, there at the inference time, we take a photo, we generate it through, and then we uh, erase that photo immediately. But basically, how we try to eliminate completely and make sure that the privacy is completely protected and everyone is safe feeling, uh, using the app, we like to fully put our technology onto the onto the device and we started doing work. That means that we'll have, make a neural network small enough to work on the mobile phone where a user can just go. That the photo will be uh, processed on the on the device, not, uh, not having to travel through like different countries, different servers and essentially uh be processed and be given back to him that way data never actually leaves your device and the uh, person is fully protected love it love it gentlemen you you guys are on to something pretty cool all right I, I i like what i i'm liking what i'm seeing what i'm what i'm hearing in terms of again that forward thinking mentality you know from, from the business development side of chris what you're doing and that that active investor that active founder of, of you paul that's that's pretty cool that, that you know what you you can actually dig and get into the weeds as well. So that, that that's good stuff, man. I uh, wish you guys nothing but the su uh, success. Again, like I say, I'm, I'm downloading the app after we get off out for this call, so I can have it ready for for my session tonight. I'm gonna send you, I'm I'm, I'm gonna send you before pictures. I'm gonna send you before, um, and, and then I'll send you the after pictures in a couple of months. But uh, I'd love to continue to having the conversation. And if there's anything in, in, in uh, parting that you'd like to share with folks, because again, I'll put the link to your website. And I'll put the link to uh, the app in the app store where folks can actually get that as well. And there were some interesting slides in your in your uh, presentation deck as well that I'll screenshot and put for for folks to uh, peruse over as well during during their investigation. But was there anything in closing that you, Chris or Paul, would have to say? Uh, I, I think, I think they're both they're both on mute. You know, I sit here and ramble, and they both put themselves on mute. Okay. <laughs> No, I, I think that's a pretty all encompassing, you know, conversation. I think we touched on a lot of interesting topics, not only based on what we're doing at NAFA, but, uh, you know, it's really awesome how you incorporated the AI scene in general and, you know, taking it just beyond the pure technical and looking at general impact. I thought that was very cool. So yeah, thank you very much. Like, uh, I think that's probably good for me. Cool. Paul's ready to go to sleep. You know, he, he's in Israel, he, you know, he, he's, he's in the future and it's already, he, he's ready to go to sleep. <laughs> no. Thank you, gentlemen. You guys be well and have a great day. And I will talk to you soon, hopefully.